Right, so let me welcome all of you in the new year. All of you which already uh, managed to get back. Have you, did you stay here mostly? Did you stay here over Christmas or? Yeah, okay. <laughs> but I don't know, I mean I have some students in Oxford, they traveled home to China. Uh, Okay, right, so uh, what I would like to talk about, in a case I find it, yes, uh, today I'd like to talk also about some uh, rather new topics about the link or the weak formulation of uh, Curvature conditions, mostly Ricci curvature condition. Uh, presumably not even this we will uh, discuss throughout, but I mostly would like to talk about the tool which is used there, namely the optimal transport, which uh, plays an important role in formulating this kind of questions. And uh, I have to admit I didn't check completely carefully what did uh, Hans Bert Rademacher discuss with you about Jacobi fields and geodesics. So let me simply tell you what I, uh, I'd like to assume to be known. So let me recall from differential geometry. Following two results, basically the first one is the differentiability of the square distance function. It doesn't make such a huge difference. Well, of course, it makes a huge difference if you differentiate a distance function at the origin. It makes a huge difference if it's squared or not. But uh, in any case, the formula become much nicer. And it's something uh, which maybe you've heard about it. So let there are two kind of statements. The one is known, I guess, and maybe the other one is more in the realm of non-smooth analysis. So let uh, suppose we are on some manifold M this is a matrix G. Riemannian manifold. So let x zero and uh, x be joined by a unique minimizing geodesic. And I consider the function f of x is, uh, doesn't matter much, just for normalization reasons, the distance from x to this point x not squared. Uh, then it's true that the gradient of this function So this uses the, talking about the gradient uses the inner product on the tension space to, to uh, find the gradient equals to minus exponential fun function at x of x zero. Maybe you have seen a formula like this. I mean, you don't need to remember the formula, you just should know that 
this function is differentiable. Um, it's as exactly what you, of course, have in Rn. There, the exponential x in, y, uh, in x of y is x plus y, and indeed the gradient of f, which is the gradient of uh, 2 x minus y, 1 half x minus y squared. <coughs> is the gradient of this with respect to x is of course uh, x minus x naught which is minus x naught minus x and therefore minus the exponential x minus so that's just the formula, which is there. What is more important, what happens in the general case? In any case, the function f uh, is super differentiable. That's because uh, <coughs> I'm not going to prove it, but the typical situation, I mean, if you, are, if you are in the sphere, let's say, and you are in the situation where you have the two geodesics which are joining at a particular point, you see what really happens is that if you continue along this geodesics, the distance function stops increasing as you would expect and it goes down again. But of course this does not prevent the existence of a super differential, right? The, the distance function basically has a concave kink. This can happen uh, and I mean there exists a P in the tangent space of m at x such that f of x prime is less or equal f of x plus uh, the scalar product p delta x. So let's say that's the, di that's the direction between x and x prime. The difference is the sc scalar product plus a small o of uh, thing squared. So this you have always, and I want also to stress the characterization that case A occurs if and only if uh, F is truly differentiable. So in general, you are super differentiable. If you also sub-differentiable, then you are truly differentiable. There exists a sub-differential of the function f. What, what is delta x? Well, delta x is essentially uh, so in the tension space to m at x, the delta x is basically the different, the, well, if you would like to introduce the uh, the direction in which you go. Anyhow, it should be something small, that's why it's delta. So. <coughs> What? Yeah, it's the it's the it's the distance. It, re it reflects the distance, right? So if I talk about the exponential, 
map, I make the flow for time one. I, I follow the geodesic for time one with the initial speed, which is here. So if you want to get close, you have to start slowly. As I say, if you want to stay close, you have to start slowly. Yes, yes. Okay, you measure the distance to x0, right? So imagine you are on the, circ on, on the sphere, right? So you travel away and, and everything is increasing very nicely. And the, the river, and the, the, the river, I mean, the distance, it's also clear that the distance grows the most, even the squared ones grows the most along the geodesic, so which gives you this formula if you calculate it properly. But then if you go through the, anti the conjugate point, you suddenly will notice that you do not increase anymore, but you actually go down. So you get a, a concave kink. Yeah. Well, you measure from x0, you are close to x, and you go down immediately. On the other side, you just, I mean, x is here, right? And the function is the distance to x0, which is not increasing anymore. For, for a very small, at least I want to be, sh I don't know what happens if you go far away from the point x, but close to the point x, you can make sure that the distance is not increasing much anymore, because you can basically perturb the geodesics which you have to reach upwards to the point x prime, and this gives you a geodesic which is not much longer. There's a formula for the variation of the, of the length along a geodesic. But you are not sure that what you have produced is the shortest one to the point x prime. So you could fall down. Okay, so that's one of the things. Uh, and I said, I think you, you've seen the things like this, uh, the squared distance has the nice advantage that you can work not with the length of the geodesics, but you work with the integral of the, of the norm of the tangent vector squared to get the, to get the norm squared, which makes, makes a nice formula and gives you a unique minima. You cannot reparameterize the things. And unique minima usually result in, in better estimates. Okay. So the other thing I would wanted to talk about is the Ricci curvature and what is a meaning of the Ricci curvature which might, which might survive in the, in the non-smooth realm. <coughs> so you remember basically I said something about the sectional curvature, the sectional curvature uh, essentially tells us how two individual geodesics are uh, moving quicker away from each other or slower away from each other compared to the Euclidean situation. And uh, we will be in a situation in the end where quite a few geodesics have a problem. I mean, you won't be, in the end, you won't be in a, in a smooth Riemannian manifold anymore. And uh, there can be all kinds of strange behaviors. And so we would like somehow to see how is the impact of Ricci cur of, of curvature, not just on a pair of geodesics, but on average, on many geodesics. How can you get some integral estimate for this? And uh, I will not derive it, I will just explain what, what is the estimate people use here. Suppose we have a geodesic. And suppose we have many more geodesics around there. So Phi, uh, psi, uh, psi, which is even the gradient of a function, psi will be later used 
is a vector field. near the image of this geodesic and uh, so the geodesic will be a flow line of the vector field as well but of course I will flow in many other directions and uh, I look at the following time t of x is the exponential in the point x of t psi x. So basically I start in this direction and at every point I start a geodesic flow, right? And I'd like to know how does this vol how does this flow change the volume. That's essentially the thing you might like to know and uh, I won't become too technical because I hope you've seen calculations of this kind. <coughs> Essentially, the formula, the estimate you have is if you think about I mean you can describe you can describe because you uh, flow of course along geodesics here, so the derivatives of this flow can be described in terms of Jacobi fields. You shouldn't be completely surprised that you get, get a formula for the relating basically the uh, volume change and the curvature. And I come up, I write down the formula which in the end comes out of the whole calculations. Let's say one D plus one over N D D T log J T square plus and this is the point which which we're interested in. Okay, where the where the J is <coughs> so essentially the J of T is the Jacobian at the point x, the Jacobian the point x of the exponential map as I defined it here t and the only thing is my vector field as I said will be a gradient of a function the function phi will be something which is called semi-convex. I will define in a moment what it is. Essentially, it means that uh, all second derivatives are bounded. Are bounded. <coughs> so if you look at this expression, you can derive a formula like this. I don't know, have you ever seen it? for the uh, curvature. 
I think we would have to go back to Jacobi fields and, and put down the whole calculation, which gets a little bit out of the, the main line. The only thing I really want from this formula, well, I want you to believe that this one is non-negative. I guess that's what you do. And uh, I want to have a conclusion, which is the following that the Ricci curvature in the manifold is bigger or equal than zero in M if and only if the second derivative of the logarithm of this Jacobian, so of this, the volume change of this underlying flow how does it behave along the geodesics? Well, and it's basically this quantity which is positive, so what we get here is this estimate. You know that the Ricci curvature is something which you, which you uh, in principle, calculate by summing sectional curvatures. <coughs> so you fix one direction, you take an orthogonal basis to this one direction, and you sum the Ricci curvatures in the, in the, in the orthogonal complement, uh, the sectional curvatures. So that's a quantity which is much more an average-related quantity. Like if you are in a situation when your space is not uh, completely homogeneous or completely nicely behaving, you would expect that, that such uh, measuring the behavior uh, um, along a field of many geodesics. I mean, I start basically ge geodesics everywhere would be a very robust way. So you know perhaps that people, if you have a flow in, in Rn of a normal ODE, people for a long time tried to follow the individual flow lines, to understand the dynamic of the individual flow lines. This might work well if the flow lines are basically, if the, if, if the field is divergence free, so then the flow lines contour, uh, correspond to streamlines of a potential or something like this. But quite often they anyhow flow lines intersect if you're not coming from such a nice situation. And then it turned out it's better not to follow the individual flow lines, but you take a measure and you flow the measure along the lines and you start to investigate how does this measure behave. I mean the idea is not look at don't look at the individual at the individual uh, flow line, but look as look at, at how the measure does behave. And of course in such a situation the divergence of the vector field also tells you how does the Lebesgue measure behave under this flow, if it's increasing or not. So this formula is basically in a very much in the same spirit. Uh, the question is what could be such a formula good for? Because you need a situation when you have many geodesics which for some reasons point in the direction of such a gradient of a semi-convex function. <coughs> and this is precisely where the optimal transport comes into the game. So this is an estimate which is known in the classical differential geometry, a way to characterize Ricci curvature and uh, to apply it we basically we'll see that very often we are in the situation that we have, that, that we have such a psi and such a psi and that we have such a flow. And this is the flow which makes the optimal transport. So the only thing I want, ah, I want to give this a double, double star and that's it. So the topic I'm really going to talk about is uh, the optimal transport is what 
product cost. Again, we are all the time in a, vect in a manifold, essentially, uh, Riemannian manifold MG. So now this is a topic which is very popular in Leipzig, I think, not just in Leipzig. So I don't know precisely how most many of you did what hear about it. I mean, uh, the Monge problem is a very old problem, and uh, it was well, it was partially solved. But then it was put asleep for a long time, I think some extent, and it was recovered in a Euclidean context, was re, uh, reborn, basically, by work by Brenier, which uh, had a quite different approach and many new applications also on his mind. And I'd like to, so maybe this work by Brenier, many people heard about it, and I'd like to talk a little bit more about the situation in uh, the Riemannian context which is, of course, inspired. So what's the Monge problem? On our Riemannian manifold, we consider the space PM probabilities <coughs> on M. Usually, we will expect that uh, they are absolutely continuous. respect to the volume. So they can be written mu is usually f times d volume, something like this, I want to say. Now suppose you're given two such probabilities, absolutely continuous or not, you can always ask yourself uh, <coughs> how can I there are two measures, both of absolute mass one. So in principle, it should be possible to move one of them onto the other. So try to do this thing in the most easiest way. So the d is the geodesic distance. And this cost you want sent to the infinimum over all T, which have the property that the push forward of T, uh, of mu under T is nu. Mm. Push forward is, okay. So this means that uh, for every A, U of A is nothing but mu of T to the minus one. Right? And of course, uh, you might, well, I think at least you remember, that one of the problems is, of course, if such, a, if such a T exists at all. Does such a T exist at all? There could be a problem if mu has an, at mu has an atom and mu doesn't have the atom, then you cannot transport the measure, you cannot spread it out. But we are usually on the safe side because of this. <coughs> there exists in general such, there are general statements much older than the optimal transport, which tell you if you have two even continuous measures, just let's say on Euclidean space, there's always a Borel function which maps one onto the other in this sense. Well, and there is a CRM which is somehow a cornerstone of uh, what I'm going to talk about. And that's why I would like to speak a bit about it. If this is a compact connected manifold, we have these two measures. Mu is basically F times the volume, 
mu is g times the volume then I put the two stars here so because I want the star here then star the first statement is has a unique solution we can even calculate uh, in some sense describe the T more, it's not just a general Borel map, but it's characterized by the following statement, T of x is the exponential as before, exponential at x of the gradient of a function phi. This gives us basically into this realm here. And now there comes some new notion. Sum d squared over 2 convex function psi. from m into r. The next condition is, uh, and this is the nice thing what, what our transport does, for mu almost every x, gamma x of t is nothing but follow the flow, this direction, follow the geodesics, uh, t times gradient x, is the unique minimizing geodesic from gamma naught to gamma 1. It just tells me, okay, so in some sense uh, this strange behavior which I talked about here does not occur too often. Right? I mean, it, it can happen of course and it's clear that here you essentially need absolute continuity of the measure, right? Because if you put yourself the Dirac, you take the Dirac here and you take the Dirac in the antipodal point. There is a map which transports, but you have no way to claim that it is a unique, that you follow a unique geodesics between the two points. And so if you take an absolutely continuous measure, then in general the transport will not go from one point to the antipodal point. And the last thing is a formula. So the Jacobian of the transport is f of x over g of tx mu almost everywhere. So this is the statement. And I say the theorem is basically uh, <coughs> due to McCann, uh, several technical improvements, because I will not talk about, and uh, it builds on when you so he handled the Euclidean case and then uh, Bob McCann looked at similar things, how they look in the uh, Riemannian context. And if you never heard much about it, it 
definitely not wrong. Talk a little bit more about the notions involved. So what is the d square convex function at all? Uh, yeah? Do you always know that uh, phi is the distance or the square distance? I mean, you, does this imply that phi is always the distance or like the square distance? Phi, phi, psi? Uh, psi, yeah. Uh, no. No? Ah. Well, from where? From one point only, or? I mean, this is here for manifolds, right? Yes, for manifolds, yes. And then we have said that the, the vertices is the exponential. You might wonder if the, if the difference between them. I mean, I mean, you have no, not just one point. In this situation, we had just one point where we measure the distance from. So where do you want to measure the distance ah, from now? I mean, it, the geodesics go from many points to many points. OK, so what is a? d squared convex function, I put it in a slightly more general context. In a, if you have a general cost function and uh, suppose we have two spaces and a cost yes. function, sometimes it's good to distinguish this artificial, I mean, even if it's the same space, you want to know where you come, start from and where you go to. Uh, okay, life is expensive. So you can have infinite cost as well. Then uh, we tell that psi. I uh, know. The psi goes from uh, x into r plus infinity is c convex. If it's basically something like the Legendre transform for convex functions, you do the same thing as you would do for convex functions, but uh, in the situation of a general C, you make the definition slightly more unsymmetric than usually. So the phi psi of x should be supremum over all y in y of psi c, the c is this c, of y minus c x y, where psi c of y is the infinimum x in x psi x plus c x y. Okay, and I put up one more notion, then we can discuss this. Uh, so the function is, is c convex if it's somehow, in this sense, the second transform of itself. If you come, do this twice, you come back to the function. And one other notion one has, and which is important, I introduce also a subdifferential. If I have a convex function, I should introduce a subdifferential as well. So the C subdifferential are those y for which uh, Uh, psi of x equals to psi of c y minus c x y. This is the c subdifferential. In some sense, uh, Brenier could do a lot of things with classical convex. Uh, 
the classical convex context. Here the things look slightly different and therefore let me briefly make the link to convexity. The motivation is that you look at the Lejeune transform So we have a phi this time from Rn into R union plus infinity. This is known to be convex if phi equals phi double prime and uh, phi double prime at y is the supremum over x in r to the n x times y minus phi of x. And then you do the, the prime is simply that you do the same transform once more. It is clear that's the only thing we know for sure in this moment, that this is always a convex function. And why, right? Because it's a supremum over a family of convex functions. It's a supremum over a family of linear functions even. Whenever the, whenever the x is fixed, this is a linear function, you take the supremum of a linear function, you will get the convex functions. So it's clear that if a function is equal to its second genre transform, it must be a convex function. <coughs> Let's look at what is the phi prime prime indeed. It is the sub over the y, inf over the z of x minus z times y plus uh, phi z. Oh, it comes from the, the infinimum comes from the minus here, which turns it around. And of course, uh, what is clear with this expression, it is less or equal than phi of x, simply taking z equals x. This makes it for every y, what is here is less or equal than uh, phi of x. And it's bigger or equal than phi of x if y is in the subdifferential, the classical subdifferential of the function phi in the point x. Because then phi of z is bigger or equal than phi of x plus y times z minus x for every z which is the notion of definition of the subdifferential, right? So once, once you have chosen the proper y, it's clear that you should recover the phi of x. And that's the meaning of the Lagrange, uh, Lagrange transform also of the, of a function. Basically, Suppose uh, you're looking for a, for a supremum. So suppose that for every, every x, you have that x times y minus phi of x is less or equal than x0, y minus phi of x0. Suppose you you really found the point x0 where the supremum 
is attained. This is, of course, just as I said before, the same as phi of x is bigger or equal than phi of x0 plus y times x minus x0. So if you think about it, the point x0, phi x0 is the point where y is in the subdifferential of the graph. Of course, you can draw very nice pictures of this. Uh, if a function goes from R into R, then you can imagine that you have a line and you move and you see. It's not so much the point where you touch, it's basically where is the position of the line which touches the graph, right? This is what the Lagrange transform, the Jano transform really tells you. Okay. And uh, I will not calculate it, but the things are not so far away from each other. The fact that we use a slightly different uh, notation with the infinimum ones. I said somehow. Uh, emphasizes the fact that the situation is not completely symmetric. Let me talk a little bit more about the C convexity. So if I take Cxy as the cost to be minus Cx times y, then you see very easily that uh, the phi of C is nothing but minus phi star. So for this notion, which is Precisely, I mean here, you would expect here to see, uh, to see essentially what comes up there. The two things are related and then, so indeed the first line in the definition is nothing else than requesting that uh, psi equals psi double star usual convexity. Uh, what happens if uh, we take C of x, y, the function we are talking about, just in the Euclidean context, square, <coughs> Then you basically find that psi of c in the point y is, okay, let me show it, it's the infinimum over x in x. Uh, psi of x plus um, x squared over 2 minus x times y plus y squared over 2. So it is uh, 1 half of y squared minus psi plus x uh, half squared and in the end uh, 
we see evaluating this that uh, psi is one half x minus y squared convex if and only if uh, psi plus like this the function which takes x to psi of x plus one half of the norm is convex if and only if the second derivative of psi is big or equal than minus the identity. Right, so this, this convexity uh, with respect to a cost can be interpreted quite often in the Euclidean context as a, as a normal one. Okay. The meaning of the subdifferential we will see later. I mean, the problem is, or the point is somehow people are very happy mm, to study such subdifferentials. So, um, because for most, I mean, we will be able to show that essentially the transport map the T we are looking for uh, will be will be in the contained in the graph of the subdifferential of the function psi. And the, the, this makes uh, it essentially single valued the T because the subdifferential doesn't have uh, too many places places where it has more than one value. Right, so the point is why I'm interested in the subdifferential you will only see in the moment. Let me just tell a bit more about the Euclidean, uh, the Riemannian situation. Not going to prove anything there but just telling. So Psi from M to R this is the usual situation, is d squared convex. It's not so clear what it really means. Quite subtle. Then it is semi-convex. So psi is semi-convex. In any chart, It is uh, convex plus uh, C2 function. And so, of course, a convex function can do this. So, you can never claim that a convex function is a C2 function. And if you look at this d squared functions, I mean, it behaves nicely. It cannot have this property because you don't obtain a Dirac in the second derivative. Cannot concentrate it. But of course, it can be any, any C2 function has a bound on its second derivative. So it's, -convex, uh, it's, it's C convex for a sufficiently big C. And uh, we can never claim that our function is really a smooth function. But it's basically a convex function plus something, which has no, makes no problems. You can say on the opposite, uh, there exists a delta positive such that every function which is small enough depending on the m is uh, convex in this form. So I'm just talking about the B of the theorem essentially. What can we really see from this? And there is essentially C, I'm not even going to write it down, there's a very close statement which is nearly the same as
is nearly a characterization characterization of uh, d squared over 2 convexity in the Riemannian context on mg. So you have to take basically, uh, you have to compare with the second derivative of a distance function there. Right? Because this is, the identity is the second derivative of a distance function. Okay. The question is still, uh, how do I find the solution of my problem? Where do I get this function from? And I called it the Monge problem for quadratic cost. Monge originally was interested in the Monge problem for linear cost, so he was just taking maybe what you also asked about, he was taking the distance between the points as the, as the cost. And uh, it turned out this was a much harder question. And people find all ways to work around. Both at least this. In a relaxed situation, not for the original problem. So the ideas behind the theorem Step one, you don't think about t, but you think about measures with the right margins. Marginals. Margins. So uh, don't think about the transport plan, the optimal, uh, sorry, optimal transport map. T, but the transport plan, pi. So pi is a probability in m times m, which had the, has the right margins, meaning that the uh, integral of h d mu is the same as the integral of h of x, y, d pi, x, y, and integral of h d mu is the same as integrating uh, integrating the h only with two respect to the second variable of, of mu. I mean, the, this, the meaning of this is clear. How does it come together with the t? If you have a t which maps the measure mu onto nu, then the t is a graph. Here there's something, the new living, here's the new living. <coughs> and now the observation is that if you lift onto this graph the measure mu, you get indeed such a measure pi. So you take the identity on the space x, and you take the t in the second variable, and with this, you make a push forward of the measure mu. Uh, it's a transport plan.
for instance, we have uh, age of x d pi x y. is of course age of the first coordinate. So you <coughs> look at a function which is defined here. So it's the first coordinate of uh, identity x tensor t. First coordinate d mu. It's the integral of h d mu. And in the same way, you see also if you project the measure down here, what you get is basically the, m the mu measure, you, you go back, you intersect the graph in many parts, you project what is the measure on the graph. The measure on the graph is just what was projected into this intersection. So the measure here is the, is the mu measure of the pre-image of the set here under T. That's the one idea. Don't look at measures living on graphs, look at all possible measures. And the advantage, this compatibility condition, the margin condition, is uh, stable under weak convergence. And this condition, which we had before, is not at all. I mean, you need some convergence on the on the on the. So you need some topology on the space of Borel maps, which gives you compactness. And whatever com topology you take, it has to be so weak that this condition of mapping the measure mu onto nu will not be stable under the convergence. And then it's very easy to find the existence of a pi which minimizes the integral. OK, and what is the integral now? The integral now is cxy d pi x, y, and you are left with the only question, does pi live on a graph? Because if it lives on a graph, you do the same procedure backwards. Then it gives a t. And historically, it was Kantorovich who introduced this idea. He worked with linear cost functions. And then he was not really able to prove that the minimizer lives on a graph. Right? So this was the only problem. He found some solutions. And uh, you can have results about, uh, which is maybe the most important for real world application, the minimum over the the minimum over this class of transport plans. So you allow to move mass into different points, which you are not allowed to move to the transport map T. The infinimum over all the transport plans is basically the same as the infinimum over all the transport maps. So from any practical point of view, you can always approximate and say, well, you do it equally good. But the existence of the minimum is not clear if the function Z the cost C doesn't have a con some quadratic, strictly convexity condition inside. Uh, and that's where the subdifferential comes into the game. So we prove this is what we're going to convince ourselves. Yes, and then you might think about it on, on your own that this implies also the uniqueness of the T. 
I said it gives a t, uh, <coughs> but if I know that every minimizer lives on a graph, it tells me also that the, the graph is unique. Okay, and the nice geometric observation here is of course that use in the step two the fact that the support of the optimal pi is C cyclical. Clearly monotone, which again is something, uh, of course, one knows for convex functions. One knows the the the, the, the derivative or the, the subdifferential of a convex function has a has a cyclically monotone graph. That's why basically people. Uh, would expect a link there, but uh, it took some time to work it out. So what does it mean? For every xi, yi, take pairs out of s, and s is the support of my minimizing transport plan. I have the following picture. If you look at the matching, so you look at x1 goes to y1, x2 goes to y2, and one more. So, so taking points here means you match the points somehow. Both are from M, but you match them in some way and you think that your transport will move uh, x1 at least partially to y1. Then of course what would you expect, what you should not do if you swap the points. this should become very expensive, more expensive than before. Because we have an optimal, an optimal arrangement between the points already, this should become expensive. I mean, to work it out really is, is a bit harder because uh, you have to... So if your map, if, if this wouldn't be the shortest possible matching, you have to be careful because it means uh, you have... You can only swap part, I mean, this of course x1, y1 being in the support of the measure means that close to x1, y1 there is some measure. Close to x2, y2 there is also some measure. So you should be able to swap the measures around. You have to respect the margins on both times. This is a bit of a technical effort but it's in principle, it's in principle not very hard. And this should show you that the matching was optimal. Optimal matching of course with respect to the cost c. So you should get Oops. You should get whenever you have such a family of points from the support of your optimal transport. Meaning that this one is minimal among all possible trans uh, transport plans. You find out that what you had in the beginning is definitely better than what you get swapping the things around. And you have of course to say that n plus 1 is 1. 
it means you cannot do in even any other transformer because every permutation can be decomposed into cycles and every cycle is more expensive than what was before. This is the definition and the support satisfies this condition. And then you can define the psi. Psi, so the first thing you do, you fix x0, y0 in the support of pi. Everybody knows what's the support of a measure? Meaning that every small neighborhood has a positive measure, right? That's the support. Uh, <coughs> you start to choose a point and then careful which way around it is. Psi of x is the supremum over all possible chains, so you don't prescribe the lengths. And you just want points to be chosen um, xi, yi out of the support s. <coughs> And now basically you take psi, uh, sorry, c, x naught, y naught minus c of x1, y naught plus c, x1, y1 minus c of x2, uh, y1. C of uh, x n y n, so this is the last one I'm using, minus C of x y n. You define this function well, and you notice that the cyclic monotonicity helps you quite a lot, so psi of x is not running off to infinity, for instance. You have this estimate, just from the cyclic monotonicity. Otherwise, you would have the danger that this, this function psi is immediately getting infinite, if you could cycle around and gain something with this. Right? It, this means that you essentially, you take a sum here over, over, over some elements which are from S, and you subtract a sum of this kind, you have just shifted the things the other way around. I mean, you, you shift it forwards instead of backwards, but this doesn't really matter. So this is important to get it bounded, and then you have a lot of other properties. Uh, and this is the most important one. Psi is C convex. Well, essentially, it's not so surprising. If you think about uh, the way we defined it, it's not completely clear what is the psi c, but if you, if you would take the front part as a candidate of uh, psi c, then you have to precisely the structure which we talked about. It's the supremum of a function depending on, now on many variables, not just on one, minus C of the same variable and an x there. It's C convex. And uh, let me just show you this that, uh, see, I'm not just swindling. So if x, y is in S, then the y is in the subdifferential of the psi in the point x. Because this is the case if and only if, mind you, psi of x equals psi c of y minus c of x y. Well, now you can look at how the psi c was defined. So you find out it's basically the same as uh, having that 
I mean, if I solve it for psi of y, uh, psi c of y, I bring it over, and it means that this quantity, which was defined as an infinimum, so it's the, the function has a minimum, the point x, it's this particular y here, if and only if psi x plus c x y is less or equal psi z plus c z y less or equal then psi of z is bigger or equal than psi x plus C x y minus C z y. Okay. <coughs> so I didn't calculate it precisely, but you see that this is really the natural notion you would expect for a subdifferential, right? The function is everywhere bigger than the value. The function is really bigger everywhere than the value at the particular point, plus the thing which is the subdifferential usually. In the convex case, you would have uh, x minus z times y here. So try to calculate that this agrees with the normal one. <coughs> well, and that's what we want. We want to show that there are only very few y's which are in the relation with the x. And for this, we use everything else we have now. Uh, we use the facts and we use what I said before. From the facts that psi is basically locally Lipschitz. because any semi-convex function is Lipschitz. So it's differentiable almost everywhere. By Rademacher theorem. <coughs> so suppose the gradient exists. at x, sorry, at x, and x, y is in s. I want to show there's only one possible choice for the y. Since by what I discussed before, it means that uh, psi x plus, this is our cost function, now we have this one half d squared x y finally. As I say, it has a minimum at x. It follows that the one half has a minimum at x, it follows that it has a, has a sub-differential in a very classical sense, because the psi is differentiable, it follows that the distance squared has a sub-differential. And by what I said in the beginning, it has a derivative. is differentiable. <coughs> and uh, so there exists a unique geodesic
from x to y. Also this was one of the statements that uh, unique minimizing uni unique minimizing geodesic minimizing geodesic from x to y. And of course I also know that uh, <coughs> because this is differentiable now the function has a minimum, it follows that the gradient of one half uh, d squared xy is just minus the gradient of psi. And by the formulas I gave you in the beginning, it tells us precisely that y equals uh, the exponential at x of the gradient of phi in the point x. <coughs> so the last step is where you really have to cheat a lot uh, if you just say it's like this. So the formal calculation is very easy and I would like to finish by showing it. Where is the problem? Even if you look just at the Euclidean case, where things are still a bit nicer. You now know that for most of the points, uh, actually there is just a single, for most of the x with respect to mu, there is just a single y which uh, lives in the subdifferential. And so the, the support of the, of the optimal transport plan pi has just one element together with x. That's all fine. But the graph of the subdifferential, even for a convex function, the graph of the subdifferential is just a monotone function. Think about a normal convex function from R to R. It's just a monotone function. And there it might become quite hard to see that any change of area formula holds true, which involves, which involves uh, the Jacobian of a map, right? So let me just write down the formal way. So one has to be a do, do a very careful analysis and we replace it by a formal argument. for every test function we have that uh, if I integrate it against mu then it's just by the uh, because I know that the pi now corresponds to a t so I can do the usual substitution t of x d mu x. This is clear. And the other thing is, of course, that I can say modulo technicalities by the area formula, the integral of uh, the test function against mu is essentially the integral of the test function times the density of nu with respect to the volume. Well, and for this you could use the chain rule. So that's composing with the t here, composing with the t here. And uh, here you have the determinant of the derivative t. volume x and you find out okay so this is the right this is g s phi of t times f 
times the volume. And now you can compare. This is clearly the same, so these two quantities must be also the same if you have equality. Right, so f of x equals uh, g tx times the determinant. Uh, this whole thing is written as the Jacobian. And because the functions are positive, I could drop the sign here. And I say to get this quantity as uh, to get this expression is uh, much more work. Of course, what one hopes to improve the regularity of t because you know the determinant of its gradient. The determinant of the gradient of the derivative is some function, maybe it's not so bad. If f and g are not so bad, you can try to uh, look at an equation which is called the Monge Ampere equation and try to derive some basic regularity for the t. Uh, <coughs> so what I next time want to do, I want just to show why we get this uh, estimate for the, in which way we can link the estimate for the Jacobian which we had for the convexity of the Jacobian along a, a geodesic to some condition of the convexity of an entropy along geodesics which comes from this flow and I also would like to talk about so this is a link to the Ricci curvature of the manifold which preserves uh, this Gromov of Hausdorff distance I introduced you last year um, and another thing I would like briefly to discuss is how the sectional curvature of the manifold influences the regularity of the T. These are the two things. So th because both of this, both of this uh, approaches basically translates very subtle higher order derivative second order derivative uh, differential expressions into a uh, much more uh, rigid uh, analytical inequality so to speak like I mean for a convex function being a convex function is something which is stable under the weakest possible mo no possibility of convergence you have so <coughs> whereas Ricci curvature is a much more complicated object and uh, we will see that we get a stable notion under Hausdorff conversion, hausdorff gromov convergence for the Ricci curvature being, uh, being non-negative and uh, this is quite easy and then I would like to say a little bit more about the regularity and the sectional curvature of the manifold, how they are related. Okay, thank you. <coughs>